Good morning, everybody. Um, it's good to see you guys. Thank you so much for coming out on this beautiful day. We're all ready for it to get hot. Um, but thank you guys so much for joining us here. And thank you to those who are joining us online. We do have quite a few of our number who are, um, you know, for different reasons, for health reasons and different things. They're, they're still um, staying home. And that's absolutely fine. We, we, we want them to be safe and to be secure and to know that they are very much loved. Um, and it's hard sometimes when we're separated and we're, when, we, we, when we can't all be together like we'd like to be and we can't all do the, th the things that we'd like to do. It gets challenging. It gets rough. And so let's look around at those who aren't with us here today, but who are with us in spirit, who are joining us online, and, 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 and let's, let's make an effort to reach out to some of those folks this week. Let's let them know that they are very much loved, very much a, a, an essential, vital part of who we are as a body of Christ. It's important that we remember that. And so let's, let's keep that in mind this week as we go forward, as we think about, um, as we think about being a family. Uh, that was a little squeaky, that's okay. Um, I do want to apologize. We are kind of working through some things. A big, big thank you to Danny, who's hiding in the closet right now. I hope you guys have had a chance to meet Danny. He's a neat guy. He started worshiping with us when we came back um, together from our closure. If you haven't had a chance to meet Danny, he's back there now, I see him. Um, say hi. Hi. He's been working really hard on getting, getting us sort of technologically wired up. And, and so we want to give him a big thank you. We did have, it wouldn't be technology without a couple of glitches. <laughs> we think we've gotten those things hammered out. We should be working okay now. Um, but thank you all so much for your patience this morning. Would you mind clicking for me? This is old school. This is a battery problem. <laughs> um, anyway, um, there's a cathedral in Rouen, France. Rouen is a French city in Normandy. It's on the Normandy coast, right there on the English Channel. And I actually got to visit this city in 1997, and I went and I saw this cathedral, and it's absolutely gorgeous. It's this beautiful, you know, European cathedral. And inside, you can go inside and tour and walk around and see all this stuff inside, and what they've got inside is a tomb with the heart of Richard Cordelion. Do you know who that is? Richard the Lionheart. The king of England, the famous crusading king. He led a crusade against Saladin to try to retake Jerusalem, and he didn't do it, but he was famous for trying. But it's a really neat place to go and visit. Rouen Cathedral has a long history that dates back to the 4th century. The 4th century, think about that. And then the whole shebang was destroyed by Vikings in the 9th century. So what did they do? They went and they rebuilt the whole thing. And the current cathedral started to take shape in around 1150 some odd. But then for centuries they kept adding on. They built spires and towers and wings to this place for centuries. And most cathedrals are like that in Europe. If you've seen any cathedrals in Europe, these are long-term building projects. And I want you to think about all the hands that went to work in creating just one of those beautiful cathedrals. How many architects? How many stonemasons? How many sculptors? And how many glass workers and carpenters and laborers toiled? on a structure like a cathedral, each one building on what came before, the work of many hands, the latter building on the work of the former, and all of them following one master plan. And in a lot of ways, 
the history of the Old Testament prophets resembles the building of a European cathedral. Built up over centuries, the body of the prophets, built up over centuries, the work of many hands, the latter building on the work of the former, and all of them guided by one master plan. And because of that, because of the process of prophecy, of developing the Old Testament prophetic canon, we can follow some, some common threads and themes throughout the prophets. Some familiar concepts and ideas that all the prophets turn to, like collaborators on a grand work of art, like parts of a symphony, or the different processes of building a cathedral. We can read in the prophet Isaiah, and he starts a theme, and then he paints part of the picture that God wants us to see. And then the prophet Jeremiah comes in, and he builds on that theme. He adds his own contribution. And then Amos and Micah and Daniel, each one of them picking up a theme and carrying it forward in Scripture until finally the prophet of hope and encouragement the prophet Zechariah, he has his turn to show us God's purpose and plan. And the theme that I want to think about this morning, the prophetic theme that I want us to think about this morning, as we look at Zechariah chapter 12, is the theme of someday. The theme of someday. Zechariah is giving us this grand vision of the scope and the scale of what it is that God will do to reclaim His people. God's grand work through history to restore His nation and to establish firmly His kingdom and His reign someday. Someday is part of the ongoing tension of the Old Testament and the kingdom of God where we have this future hope based on the promises of God, and yet we still have to live in the unrealized present. Someday is the vision of the future that we've been given by God, to where His reign is full and present and engaged in our lives on earth, against the reality of where we stand right now as seen through what God has told us that He is going to do. And someday is one of the threads that link all the prophets together. Someday is the thread that links the prophets to Jesus Christ. Someday is what makes us turn the page from Malachi chapter 4 to Matthew chapter 1. And Zechariah, the prophet of hope and encouragement, he builds on that tension, that someday tension. He takes full advantage of this theme in Old Testament prophecy. And it's inherent right in his central message. The tension of someday exists right at the heart of the big theme of Zechariah's message. You remember what it is? Chapter 1 and verse 3. When God says to his people, return to me, and I will return to you. The promise of the someday lives right at the heart of God's promise to His people. And that in turn informs all of Zechariah's prophecies. We've seen the instructions, return to me, God says, return to me. We've seen that in the first eight chapters of Zechariah's message. We've seen it in God's language of choosing. When God says, I choose Jerusalem, I have chosen Zion, and like a brand plucked from the fire. We've seen the tension of someday, the return to me in God's defense of his people before the accuser in Zechariah chapter 3. We've seen it in God's cleansing his people of all their stains as, as, as exemplified by the high priest. We've seen that call to return to the Lord in the visions of the flying scroll 
and in the judgment of the world in chapter 6. And we've seen this call to return to the Lord. We've seen it build and build and build until there's this just explosion of God's presence in chapter 8. This overflowing of who God is and what He's promised us. He is a jealous God who loves His people. Um, it's either on my desk or in my brown bag on the chair. I think it's on the desk. Our God is a jealous God who loves His people. Our God has promised us security and rest within His holy city where His protection extends to the old and to the young alike. We've seen this assurance that we have of our salvation. We've seen our God go forth sowing peace. We've got this hope of blessing and joy and peace that comes from knowing who God is and what He's promised to do. That's the someday. In 8.23, Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 23, there's this odd little line. It's really kind of weird. It says, In those days, ten men from the nations of every tongue shall take hold of the robe of a Jew. It's such a funny picture. These ten people reaching out and grabbing this guy's robe. And they say, Let us go with you. For we have heard that God is with you. And that's the someday right there. That is not the world we live in most of the time. The nations continue to oppose our God and His people. We live with opposition from those who would persecute and ridicule and demonize God and His people. Jesus Himself tells us in John chapter 15, verses 18 through 20, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were were of the world, the world would love you as its own, Jesus says. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. Therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. That's part of the someday, that tension of persecution and hate that we face, that the world brings us, that's part of the someday tension that the prophets talked about. But that's not all of the someday tension. Because another aspect of the someday tension is that God's people continue to struggle. God's people continue to struggle with their opposition to God. God's people will continue to struggle with our own opposition to God. That's the tension Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7. Romans 7, that famous passage where Paul says he knows what God wants of him. Paul is fully aware of what he ought to do. And in fact, Paul's desire is to do what is right. But what does Paul find himself doing over and over again? Paul himself says, I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. And these are all part of the someday, the tension that Christians face in the world and the tension we face within ourselves to do what is right. And yet we keep finding ourselves stumbling and doing what's wrong. And we don't even know why. We know that there is a difference between who we are today and who we will be when God returns to claim us. We know that the promise is out there. We know 
that we will be with Jesus when our race is run, but we look in the mirror and we look at the work of our hands and we think, how is that possible? Well, I hope it won't surprise you too much to know that the prophet of hope and encouragement speaks to this. Zechariah chapter 12, there we go. In Zechariah chapter 12, what we're going to see is God's answer to both the opposition that his people face in the world and that internal someday tension that we all struggle with in our own opposition to God. God is going to reconcile all things to himself. And Zechariah chapter 12 paints us a picture of that. And it's the, Zechariah 12 is the second of two oracles given to the prophet Zechariah. Last week, we looked at the first of the two oracles. The promise of the coming of the king into his own, remember? This week, we're going to look at the second oracle. This is God's two-part pledge to make good on his covenant promises. This is God reaffirming to his people that he will do what he has said he was going to do. This is important to us today because we stand as heirs to the promises that God made through Abraham. The covenant promises are our promises too. This is what Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 3. He says, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. That means you. That means you are heirs to the promises. So when God tells us in Zechariah 12, I will keep my promises, who is he talking to? Right to you. Speaking directly to us through the prophet of hope and encouragement. This should encourage us. This should give us hope. We stand in the shoes of those who heard his voice when we read his words. His message guides our hope. His oral oracle encourages us in our pilgrimage through the someday world that we live in. So let's get into it. Zechariah chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. This is the first part of God's pledge to keep his promises. The first part is God's promise to vindicate his people. God's promise to vindicate his people. Listen to the words of Zechariah. The oracle of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. Behold, I am about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all the surrounding peoples. The siege of Jerusalem will also be against Judah. On that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will surely hurt themselves. And all the nations of the earth will gather together against it. On that day, declares the Lord, I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness. But for the sake of the house of Judah, I will keep my eyes open when I strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. Then the clans of Judah shall say to themselves, the inhabitants of Jerusalem have strength through the Lord of hosts, their God. Our God, remember, we learned this in Zechariah chapter 8, our God is a jealous God. And he's jealous for his people. God's jealousy is a function of his love for us. He wants us to be his. And the same God who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man within him, that's 12 verse 1, He's telling his people right here that he will act decisively to restore his fallen creation. And he's going to do that by keeping his promises to his people. This is God telling us his jealous love for his people 
His desire to be our God and for us to be His people, that love that He has for us like a husband to a bride, will not allow His people to be ashamed for the cause of His name. All those who would stand opposed to God's people will face judgment for their actions. And in Zechariah's oracle in chapter 12, we see God's judgment coming. And it's all this familiar language that we've seen before of battle and conflict. We see Jerusalem under siege and horsemen and riders. The nations of the earth gathered around God's people, besieging them. But look at what God does. He says that he will make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all the surrounding people. There's some context here that's important because Zechariah is prophesying in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah when they came back to rebuild the temple. Nehemiah chapter 4 talks about a man named Sanballat. Maybe I'm saying that right. Sanballat. This guy rallied all the surrounding people in Nehemiah 4 and verse 8 to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. God's enemies are out there. And God's enemies strike hardest against God's people. Paul's constantly warning the church against external threats like that. False teachers and those who would try to stir division and cause strife and conflict within the church. It's a common theme in the New Testament. And God says he's going to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering. What is that? Well, you're supposed to imagine like all the nations and people coming to Jerusalem and they see it as this great prize, this this cup, this prized treasure that they're going to drink from all the riches and glory of Jerusalem. But God says instead they're going to be sent reeling, staggering away as drunk men when they try to lay claim to God's possession. Or, if you don't like that image, the image of a heavy stone. This picture of all these different nations surrounding God's people, surrounding his holy city, and they come to claim it, and when they go to lift the prize, one, two, three, up, oh! Strained backs as far as the eye can see. That's the picture God's painting for us here. They're going to hurt themselves when they try to lay claim to God's God's own. And he's going to scatter the horses, and he's going to cause madness among the riders, but He's not going to turn a blind eye to the chaos. God says he's going to keep his eyes open. He's going to look out for his people. God's protection has not been withdrawn. His love and care have not gone away. His eyes are open. And in verse 5, we read that the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall have strength through the Lord of hosts, their God. This is a promise that we absolutely 100% see fulfilled in the New Testament. These words are absolutely fulfilled in the New Testament. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when Paul talks about his struggle with the thorn in the flesh, three times Paul prayed that God remove this affliction from him. Apparently, the first two times Paul got no response. And the third time Paul heard these words. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. This is a promise that we see fulfilled in Philippians chapter 4, when Paul is talking about the various seasons of life that he's been through, times of plenty and times of need, times of abundance and times when he's been brought low. And Paul says, through it all, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is a promise that we see fulfilled in 1 Timothy chapter 1 when Paul tells Timothy, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Paul's strength comes from Christ Jesus, strength to serve as a minister of the church, strength to serve as a teacher of the law, strength to serve as one who would bear the name of Christ in this world. And Paul says that he does all of that through the strength that Jesus provides. 
God will vindicate his people against those in the world who would seek to do them harm. That's the first part of his promise. And what's the second part? The second part speaks to that someday challenge within us. When God says, I will convert my people. God promises that he will convert his people. And really, when God says that he's going to vindicate his people, what he's really saying is that he's doing that, remember Ezekiel 36, he's doing that for the sake of his name. That's why God chooses to act. It's because his people have tarnished his name, and God says, well, I'm going to restore that and be a light to the world. But God vindicates his people for the sake of his name, and then he turns his attention to those who are his. So let's take a look then at Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. God says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace, pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. On that day, the mourning in Jerusalem will be great. we skip ahead to chapter 13 and verse 1, God says, on that day, there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. Where does God's conversion of his people begin? It starts with God's spirit. God tells us that he will pour his spirit out on his people. This is the same God who in chapter 12 and verse 1 stretched out the heavens, founded the earth, and formed the spirit of man within him. And now God says he is sending forth his spirit. His spirit that gives grace and the spirit that generates within us the cry for grace, those pleas of mercy that come up before God. And all of this happens, and it is so powerful. It's, it, it's almost hard to look at. God says this happens so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him. God is telling the prophet Zechariah, the prophet of hope and encouragement, that His spirit will come. It will be a spirit of grace. There will be pleas for mercy because his people are going to look on him whom they have pierced and it's going to do something within them. It's going to affect them somehow. There will come a day, God says, when they will look on him whom they have pierced and they will mourn. And we can read all about that day. We have a very good picture of that day. It's in Acts chapter 2. I'm pretty sure that Zechariah is prophesying the day of Pentecost here. I think what he's talking about is exactly what we see happen in Acts chapter 2. You remember in Acts 2, God's Spirit, it descends on his apostles. They begin to preach Christ to the Jews who can hear them in whatever language they need to hear it in. And then Peter begins to speak. And he starts in Joel chapter 2. Where does he start? He starts with, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And from there, Peter preaches Christ crucified. He preaches the one whom they have pierced. The Son of God who was sacrificed for our sins. And when the people looked on Jesus this way, in this light, with this information in their hearts, what happened when they looked on Him whom they have pierced? They mourned. It cut them to the heart. Because what happened on that day is that a fountain opened up. On that day there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin 
and uncleanness. There's something that happens when Jesus dies. It's something that John talks about in John chapter 19 and in verse... My glasses are way over there. We're going to go with verse 24. 34. One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. It's an interesting detail that John throws in there, blood and water. I don't think that has anything to do with any medical reason for why Jesus died on the cross. I think it's because on that day there was a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness because the blood and the water came out of his side and it formed a fountain. And it's still pouring out blood and water to wash us, to cover us, to forgive us, to convert us to our God, to bring us back to Him. Because on that day, a fountain was opened to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. And we have access to that fountain right now, today, through baptism. Where we, can, where we can be cleansed from sin and uncleanness. When we look on Him who was pierced and we mourn because He was pierced for us, for our sins, for our guilt, we can be washed in that fountain. We can be forgiven and we can be converted back to our God just like Zechariah tells us. Just exactly the way the prophet of hope and encouragement describes us. It's a powerful message that we all need to heed and understand and that we ought to be able to share. That there is a fountain free. It's for you. It's for me. Won't you come to the fountain? It's open for all. I've asked Troy to lead that song for us. He's going to do that. We're going to stand together and sing. And if you need encouragement or prayers, if you need anything that we can offer to help you or to guide you or to show you from God's Word, let us know as we stand together and as we sing. There's